History tells the story of the world and of our lives. Sometimes that history goes bump in the night. Broadcasting from the center of oddity and the supernatural in Central Florida, it's the History Goes Bump podcast. Hello, you spectacular people. Welcome to this 86th episode of the History Ghost Bump podcast. Ghost tours for the theater of the mind. I am your host, Diane. And this is Denise. And today on this episode, we are going to Australia and we're going to jail again, Denise. We are spending a whole lot of time in jail. On this episode, we're doing the Pentridge Prison and this was suggested to us by our History Ghost Bump research crew member, Rachel Hoare, and she also did a lot of the research for us. And so thank you for this one, Rachel. Before we do that, we want to point you at our website, historyghostbump.com. And Denise, if people want to get a hold of us, where can they do that? They can do that at historyghostbump at gmail.com. And we had a ton of people join us over at the Spooktacular crew. Yes, we did. We have Cricket. Hey, Cricket. Katrina. Hey, Katrina. Amanda. Hi, Amanda. Donna. Hey, Donna. Isabella. Hey, Isabella. Alicia. Hi, Alicia. Carol. Hey, Carol. I hope this is Mikhail. It's M-Y-H-K-A-I-L. Hi, Mikhail. Matthew. Hi, Matthew. Chuck. Hey, Chuck. Eli. Hi, Eli. Leland. Hey, Leland. Teresa. Hi, Teresa. Daniel. Hey, Daniel. Harmony. Hey, Harmony. Chase. Hey, Chase. Jessica. Hi, Jessica. And Amrelia. I hope I said that right, too. And hello, Amrelia. We got a couple of comments over at the website. We have Lee from Australia. So isn't it fitting that we're going to Australia on the show today? Absolutely. Hi, Diane and Denise. You two have a wonderful podcast. I've listened to all the episodes and can't wait for the next. I love the paranormal and I love hearing the history behind the stories and legends. You two have a fabulous way of telling the stories, making them interesting and sometimes funny. I listen to many podcasts and yours is one of my top four favorites. Oh, perfect. Pretty cool. Your banter and sometimes a bit off-track thoughts and ramblings make your show an all-around winning show. Love, love, love it. You two are legends. <laughs> wow. That's, uh, I don't know about the legends part, part, but at least they like our <laughs> rabbit holes that we go down. <laughs> I commented back. I'm like, so we could someday be like the hook man or the Jersey devil or Mothman? Woohoo! <laughs> legends. <laughs> Creepy. <laughs> And Cameron said, love the podcast. Favorite episodes thus far are Tombstone and Alcatraz since I've been to both. Keep up the great work. Also, I'm from Utah. Could you find any haunting history from this location? Thanks. I'm pretty sure we could find some haunted history in Utah. That's actually the state I was born in. Just a little bit of trivia there. That could almost be terrifying in and of itself. It was. <laughs> we will definitely find a place. Uh, probably will be sometime in February. We've got a lot of... Uh, a lot of suggestions from our listeners. It's great, but it's got us booked out pretty far. So. Yes, it does. But that, that is fantastic. We love your ideas. Also, we've got some more reviews over at iTunes. Mar Little Pony, five-star, consistently great, interesting stories and facts are shared by well-spoken women who are a pleasure to listen to. No episodes are boring. Information is easy to follow. Host voices are clear, and the sound quality is consistent. A favorite. Thanks, Thank Mar Little Pony. <laughs> we both Interrupt each other. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Melissa's Mama. Glad I found this five stars. Very well done podcast. I'm impressed how much information they give in the perfect time. I prefer how they focus so much on the history of the place than just the haunting. Great job. Well, thank you, Melissa's Mama. Yes, thank you. Kraken Attack. And you know, I love this because <laughs> the Kraken. Like yeah, yeah and it, it. it appears in my novel, only instead of in the water, my Kraken is in the air. Of course, because you don't do anything like everybody else. That's right. I have to be different. Like a great book. Speaking of which, five stars. <laughs> I found this podcast through Bizarre States. Recommendation. I'm a fan of history and ghost stories, TV shows, haunted history, dark matters, and drunk history, as well as true crime, which tends to weave itself into haunted locations. The ladies talk so soothingly calm that, like a great book, I've fallen asleep during the episodes. It's all around a great podcast that I can't get enough of. I have to say there are some podcasts that I listen to that the voice is enough that it would soothe you right to sleep. So as long as it's just that we're soothing you to sleep and not boring you to death. <laughs> and we got another review from Canada. SXC Bunny. 
I wanted to say how much I enjoyed your last podcast. I heard about your podcast through Bizarre States, and I love the blend of history and spooky stories. Being from Ottawa, your last podcast was really enjoyable, so that's obviously the Carleton County Jail. I even learned things I should have known from living here. I definitely need to look into those haunted tours and visit the jail. Do it for sure. I We want to do it ourselves. So Yes, I've already been checking, and I think I've already said it before, but 21 hours and we could be there. <laughs> And we got another review from Australia. Oh, perfect. This is from Cable Digital, five-star review. Very appreciative of both hosts, Denise and Diane. Great to hear a podcast like this that feels fun and less serious. Much love and respect, Sean and Liesl. You ready to go back to jail, Denise? I am. And to go back down under? Now that I definitely am. (laughs) All right. Hi there. You were expecting the voiceover girl, weren't you? Well, I pushed her aside so that I can tell you about the Haunted True Crime podcast. Do you like true crime? Would you like it with a twist? Well, that's what we offer to those who are sponsoring us at a $5 or above level. We're up to Haunted True Crime number nine. We've covered the Cleveland Torso murders, the death of George Reeves, the Manson murders, the death of Kate Morgan, the Black Dahlia murder, Little Hell's Death Corner, Serial Killer, Her Baumeister, and the Fox Hollow Farm. And we've done a few History Ghost Bump bonus casts. When you become an executive producer and decide to sponsor the show, you get all of those past Haunted True Crime episodes, plus any of the History Ghost Bump bonus casts that you've missed. You can either sponsor us through Patreon, or if you don't like that method, you can also do it through PayPal. You just mark the recurring monthly box. And then what happens is if you are doing it through PayPal, I will email you any of the brand new episodes that we produce. And I send you a Dropbox folder so that you can get all of the past ones. These extra episodes are just a way for us to say thank you to those of you who are able to sponsor us. We greatly appreciate it. Check out the Support the Show tab at the HistoryGhostBump.com website. Pilots flying a plane from Australia to Malaysia that was full of 2,186 sheep got quite the start when their fire warning went off. The smoke warning indicated that the cargo hold was full of smoke. They made an emergency landing that kept the plane on the ground for two and a half hours while the fire warning was investigated. No fire was found anywhere. As a matter of fact, there was no indication of any burning or any smoke at all. But there was a lot of sheep manure, and there seemed to be a lot of gas from the sheep. Apparently there was so much farting going on by the sheep that it set off the smoke warning. I've heard of a green haze, but this takes the cake. The plane was cleaned and the sheep were loaded up again and the flight continued to its destination. The fact that sheep farts could bring a plane down for an emergency landing is not only hilarious, it's downright odd. This history podcast is haunted. This day in history. And today's This Day in History is by Jessica Bell. On this day, November 29th in 1877, U.S. inventor Thomas Edison demonstrates his hand crank phonograph for the first time. Edison was trying to improve the telegraph transmitter when he noticed that the movement of the paper tape through the machine produced a noise resembling spoken words when played at a high speed. His original phonograph was a machine that had two needles, one for playback and one for recording. When Edison spoke into the mouthpiece, the vibrations of his voice would be indented into a tinfoil sheet coated cylinder via the recording needle. The first words recorded by Edison were, Mary had a little lamb. In 1878, Edison established the Edison Speaking Phonograph Company to sell the new machine. Edison suggested many uses for the phonograph, such as letter writing and dictation, phonographic books for blind people, music boxes, and toys, just to name a few. In 1917, when the U.S. became involved in World War I, the Edison Company created a special model of the phonograph for the U.S. Army so that soldiers could take music off to war with them.
You're listening to History Goes Bump. Coburg, Victoria, Australia, didn't always have that name. It was originally known as Pentridge, and it was infamous for being home to the Pentridge Prison. This prison was one of the most notorious in Australia, housing some of the worst of the worst, and was open for 146 years. Today, it is the setting for fashion shows, parties, conferences, and even weddings. As is the case with many old jails, this one is restless behind the scenes, or should we say behind the veil. Spirits roam the cell blocks. Come with us as we explore the history and hauntings of Australia's Pentridge Prison. Coburg, Victoria was originally occupied by the Warren Jewry people of the Kulin Nation, and I'm sure I butchered that name. <laughs> and no worries, Diane, because our listeners are always sure to let us know about our <laughs> mispronunciation. Well, we know we've got all those Australian listeners, so I'm sure they'll jump on me and say, no, that's not how they say it. <laughs> and laugh at us and do what they all do. This tribe was spiritually connected to the land upon which they lived, and they conducted sacred ceremonies and corroborees there near Mary Creek. Kuribori is the anglicized version of the aboriginal word Karaberi, which is the name given to the singing and dancing ceremonies practiced by the aborigines. Not all of these were specifically sacred. Designs were painted on the body that represented the particular ceremony taking place, and special costumes and instruments were made. All members of a tribe took part in Koroboris. Europeans arrived in 1837 to survey the land, and the first effort was led by Robert Hoddle. Hoddle marked out a 327-acre area to set up a village. A surveyor named Henry Foote came through in 1840, and he named the village Pentridge after the place where his wife was born, Pentridge, Dorset, England. By 1849, 21 farms had been established. It would be the Victorian gold rush in the 1850s that would cause the population of Pentridge to really grow. The Victorian gold rush followed on the hills of the California gold rush. Gold was first discovered in a place known now as Specimen Goli, and soon thereafter in Bendigo and Ballarat in Victoria. The gold rush drew men keen to strike it rich, around 500,000 of them. A few claimed getting as much as 96 ounces in one pan, which equals out to about $100,000 today. Fun fact is 2% of the United Kingdom population moved to Victoria in the 1850s. That is mind-numbing to think that 2% of the UK population moved to Australia. That's a lot of English people in Australia. (laughs) That's a gold rush for sure. Some of the prospectors were rough and prone to violence and drink. The population increase led to an increase in crime, and the Melbourne jail was the closest place to put these characters, but it soon became overcrowded. A spot for a new jail was found in Pentridge, about five miles from Melbourne. This jail was originally known as the Pentridge Stockade. It was built in 1851 and officially declared a prison in 1852. The original structure of Pentridge was informal, with wooden structures for prisoners to be caged inside. These cages were wheeled so they could be easily transported for labor purposes. That is just really interesting. I would love to see what that looked like, just all these cages that they were wheeling around. Kind of like its own uh, people's zoo or something. Prisoners worked in chain gangs. After deposits of bluestone were found... It became unnecessary to transport the convicts because they could be employed mining the stone right near the jail. In 1854, the Crystal Palace was built over two acres and made of thick hardwood. The walls rose 12 feet high and was considered more secure. Platforms provided a way for guards to keep an eye on all the comings and goings from the prison. It was painted black and food and bedding were sparse for both the guards and the prisoners. Prisoners were kept chained at all times and were forced to sleep in overcrowded and deplorable conditions. Though this new structure was more challenging to escape from, it did not stop prisoners from plotting and planning escape plans. It's kind of funny that they call that the Crystal Palace, because when I think of the Crystal Palace, I think of the Crystal Palace that... In New York City. In New York City, that the Crystal Palace restaurant at Magic Kingdom was that we love to go to was named after... That's exactly what I was thinking, too, and I thought how bizarre that they called this part of the jail that they'd built the Crystal Palace. Yeah, because it's thick 
thick hardwood, which doesn't kind of emulate crystal no. in any way, shape, <laughs> or form. Not a bunch of windows and stuff, so I'm not sure if it was uh, just a weird nickname that they gave to it. I'm not sure. A local paper reported of the prison, quote, Upon inquiry as to the condition of the stockade, we found everything just about as complete as could be expected. A man of ordinary strength could push out the weatherboards with a single thrust of his arm. The shingles may be poked off the roof with a stick from the inside. If the flooring boards are lifted, the whole gang could walk out. For the building in on piles some feet from the ground and below the floor is not enclosed. Every opportunity is offered to them to run away, end quote. Also, I guess if the opportunity is there, you can keep them in prison and do whatever. I don't know. I'm surprised that any of them stayed. If you could get out that easily, why didn't they all just make a run for it? I'm not sure. <laughs> I mean, you got to love it when the local paper guy comes by and goes, yeah, you just push your hand up and you're out the roof. Of course, with, if it was guarded, it wouldn't be quite that easy. But it wasn't that heavily guarded, so it would have been kind of easy. I, I, you can only imagine the people who live near there. That must have been fun. Well, maybe maybe they didn't have any k- kangaroo suits to <laughs> hop away in. <laughs> oh, oh, that's wait. right. R- wrong prison. <laughs> wrong prison. <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't resist. More permanent structures were then built between 1857 and 1864, and bluestone was used to build walls around the property. Colonel William Champ arrived in 1857 and established order in the prison. Champ was a big believer in silence and solitude. This is something we have discussed about other prisons that were run during the same time in some of our previous episodes. Prisoners saw no one except the guards, and they were referred to by a number rather than by their name. The prison was broken into different divisions, and many of those still stand today. In the early years, panopticons were used to exercise the prisoners. Panopticons were circular and broken into areas similar to a wagon wheel with a center structure and then stone-walled spokes radiating outward. Prisoners were given one hour in one of the wedges in order to exercise. Prisoners were punished with flogging or solitary confinement with only bread and water. Some of the more violent offenders were confined on hulks, which were floating prison boats in a harbor near Williamstown. Women had their own division, A, until 1871. The three-story D division was built, and it housed female prisoners until 1956, when Fairly Female Prison was opened. Several industries were established in the prison that included a tailor shop, blacksmith, woolen mill, carpentry, and a timber yard. Moving into more modern times, it was known as a place of extreme brutality by the guards. New inmates were subjected to a ritual called the Licorice Mile, where they were beaten naked. Killings amongst the inmates were common, with the guards only enforcing punishment if the inmates touched one of their own. H. Ward was reserved for the most brutal, high-risk offenders. But it wouldn't be until the 1950s that the jail became a more humane place. The jail was open for 146 years and had 3,165 prisoners pass through the doors, with 11 of them being executed. One of those prisoners was Jean Lee, and she was the last woman executed in Australia. She'd been part of a trio that played something called the Badger Game. It consisted of her enticing a man into meeting her for a rendezvous And once they were in the room, one of her accomplices would come in and pretend to be her outraged husband. They would then blackmail the man. One of these men fought back. They tied him up, tortured him, and stabbed him. Jean confessed to the crime, but some thought she was covering for one of her accomplices, who was also her lover. On the day of her execution, she completely lost it. She became hysterical and had to be sedated. She fainted when the executioner came in and they had to strap her to a chair and carry her so that she could be hanged. I would think I'd get a little hysterical, you know, facing my execution, but... Yeah, you see, you know, when they show the movies and stuff, they appear to walk so stoically. I don't know that I'd be so stoic if I knew this is it. Yeah, it's always a weird a weird thing to think that you know you're walking to your death. I wonder what that would be like. I don't want to know, but... No, (laughs) I don't want to know either, for sure. I mean, there would be a positive to knowing exactly the hour and the day of your death. Then you don't have to wonder, or the means. 
I think I'd forgo that for the mystery of it all. Her two accomplices were also hanged that day, so they all got it. Other prisoners included Gary David, who was a self-mutilator that was incarcerated longer than anyone in the history of the Victorian prison system. He used his time in prison to write threatening letters and cutting off pieces of his body. He cut off 74 of his own body parts, including Denise, his penis. He did that in prison? To himself. Okie dokie, so he doesn't need no Lorena Bobbitt. No, he was his own. And then he died after ingesting razor blades. Interesting character. <laughs> Is that what you call that? Interesting? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. How, how would you even swallow a razor blade? Like this? <laughs> <laughs> There were two members of the Pentangill family incarcerated here. They were Dennis, Mr. Death Allen, for the rape and murder of 15 people, including the dismembering of a Hells Angel biker with a chainsaw. That's nice. Oh, my gosh. And his younger brother, Victor George Pierce, for drug trafficking. Well, at least he was a little bit of a, I don't know, his crimes were a little bit more gentler. Well, you always think of Hells Angels as being these, which they are, these mm-hmm. like tough Big guys. Big guys. And so, I mean, maybe that's why he took a chainsaw, but that that's another pretty sick man. They did say the worst of the worst. They definitely had the worst of the worst here. And finally, Edward Joseph Leonsky, who was an American soldier. He served during World War II and killed women during the brownout periods of low lighting enforced on the city. People called him the brownout strangler for this reason. He was hanged at Pentridge in 1942. Melbourne Jail was closed in 1929, and its prisoners were relocated to Pentridge. The living prisoners were not the only ones transferred. Unbelievably, 33 prisoners who had been executed at Melbourne were reinterred at Pentridge. One of those bodies belonged to the infamous bushranger Ned Kelly. These 33 bodies joined the bodies of the 11 executed at Pentridge, meaning 44 bodies were buried here at one time. The last prisoner executed at Pentridge was Ronald Ryan in 1967 via hanging. He had shot a police officer during a prison escape. The 1980s saw much unrest within the prison with rioting and drug use running rampant. In May of 1997, the northern part of the prison was closed. The southern part was closed in November of that same year. In 1999, the jail was sold and developed into housing, parkland, and a business precinct. Tours are offered of the prison. And as we mentioned in the intro, they have weddings there, conventions, dining experiences, you name it. And so it, some of the pictures looked very interesting. You got all of these fancy decorated tables in the middle of a cell block, which they called divisions rather than cell blocks. But Interesting. That would be kind of a unusual place to plan your wedding or <laughs> I would say location. So. I don't know. Maybe they have some nicer buildings that they've built on the property for the weddings. I'm not sure. Or you just (laughs) might have people that are like, hey, this would be cool to get married in a cell block. Hey, you know, I'm going to marry the old ball and chain. Might as well be in jail. Ha ha ha. If you had said that to me, I would have said, okay, let's wait another year (laughs) and make really, really sure. I love the way you say that and make really, really sure as you uh, throttle me, kick me. I know how to stay in line when you're a seventh degree black belt. Yeah, because I throttle and kick you on a regular basis. (laughs) (laughs) You're so abused. (laughs) I know. As is the case with so many prisons, the spirits are at unrest at Pentridge Prison. Karen, who was a governor at the prison, relates the following experience. I worked in the Victorian Prison Service, Australia, for 16 years. I began my career at H.M. Pentridge Prison, Coburg, Victoria. The site, now partially torn down, was home to 1,200 male and female prisoners at any one time. This encounter took place in D Division, originally constructed for female prisoners in 1880, but was currently the remand facility for 320 maximum security male prisoners. One night, a young male prisoner had slashed his wrists and arms in a suicide attempt. He had lost a life-threatening amount of blood, and six of us were desperately trying to stem the flow while waiting for the mobile intensive care ambulance to arrive. At one point, the senior prison officer requested that I run out of the infirmary, up a shot landing to call 000, your equivalent of 911, to get an ETA on the ambulance. As I ran up the stairs, I hit what felt like an ice wall and was momentarily stopped in my tracks. 
The air around me became instantly chilled, and although this was in the middle of summer, I was cold and could see my breath. I was then able to get up the last six steps, but when I turned around, I saw an opalescent fog crystallize into the form of a woman. She wore long skirts, a cap on her head, and when she turned her face towards me, I got the impression of a woman old before her time, with uncountable horrors and sorrows written in the depth of her staring blue eyes. She then vanished, and the air around me returned to its warm and humid state. I've never forgotten her face, and that five to ten second interlude meant that I hadn't called and annoyed the ambulance service, as the sound of the siren was heard as the image vanished. I went in search of files and possible photographs to try and find this restless soul. I now have it narrowed down to three possible women, all transported from England, all of Irish extraction, all for seven to fourteen years hard labor for crimes such as stealing one shilling's worth of bread. She saved me from annoying an already busy emergency service and made me acutely aware of how much of us we leave behind for other people to learn from. You know, that always makes me really sad, these people that were in prison for stealing bread when they probably were stealing bread because they were starving. I mean, nobody steals bread because they're like, ooh, let me see if I can pull it off. Or You never hear of people doing a great bread heist. You know, it's like a bank heist, yes, but bread heist, I've never heard of a bakery getting robbed for bread. Exactly. And if it's women, did they have children they were trying to feed? Exactly. And 7 to 14 years hard labor. There are people who do some horrible crimes here in America that don't get that much time for the crimes that they're doing. And this is for a shilling's worth of bread. That's just... Uh, that was pretty terrifying. I can't imagine running it. So basically, she ran through the woman and then turned around and saw her, is what, how I would interpret it. I know. Somebody was talking to me about that today, and they said, oh, that kind of stuff creeps me out. I said, oh, I really enjoy all of it. I said, now, if I ever do see a full-bodied apparition, that could change in a heartbeat, because <laughs> I don't know. That would be very terrifying. The ghost of Mark Chopper Reed is said to have started haunting the jail after his death in 2013 from liver failure. Mark Reed was an underworld hitman and participated in a number of violent crimes, leading him to be in prison for most of his adult life. He also wrote a number of books based on his life as a criminal. He has been seen near his old block in the D Division and has been heard cussing at those participating in ghost tours. He sometimes leans against a wall with his arms crossed and other times he is standing and smoking a cigarette. The Lantern Tour group was hosting a tour one night when something incredible happened. A spine-chilling shout echoed down the bluestone walls. It was the voice of a male screaming, Get Get out! The tour counted its number to make sure one of them hadn't broken off to play a prank. Another scream echoed down the corridor, and this time it bellowed, Get the the F out! The yell came from near cell 16, which had been Chopper's cell. The Lantern Ghost Tour group were hurried outside, and the managers called police. And, of course, they found no one. So, I don't know. Was that Chopper come back to his old stomping ground and yelling at these people to get out? Very possibly. Can you imagine that, though? You're lucky to pick up EVPs on tape that you don't hear. This is audible screaming at you, enough that they thought it was one of them screwing around. Yeah, they wouldn't have had to gather me up. I would have already been out waiting for them. (laughs) I would have said, you wouldn't have to shout the second time. I'm already out. Bye-bye. I'm already outside going, (laughs) hey, here I am. There is a fog shape that looks like a woman that wanders the prison, and dogs react badly to being within the prison after dark. There are also strange sounds which no one can find the source of. Disembodied footsteps are heard as well. No one likes walking around there alone in the dark, and I don't blame them. <laughs> I know, as best I can imagine, not. So do the spirits of former prisoners still walk the cell blocks? Is the dark energy that must have permeated these prison walls bringing something from beyond the veil? Is Pentridge Prison haunted? That is for you to decide. Be interesting to take a tour there for sure. Look forward to that someday. Absolutely. And any of our Australian friends, if you want to go check it out and get it ready, let us know. (laughs) We had enough donations in the month of November that it put us over that hundred mark, which means we'll have a contest. Perfect. Which is kind of cool since it's going to be Christmas, too. So it's like getting a Christmas present for one lucky listener. A Christmas present from History Goes Bump. Exactly. So why don't we have Christmas Day be the day we do the drawing? 
So that will be the limit when you have to do one of the following things. Either you need to have signed up for our newsletter. If you're already signed up for it, you're already entered. Join the Spooktacular crew over at Facebook. And And again, if you're already a member, you are already entered. Obviously, all of our executive producers are already entered. And if you can't do any of those things, you don't, you're unable to sign up for the newsletter, you are unable to become a member of the Spectacular crew, you can send us an email with your name and make sure that you put in the subject line, December contest, and we will enter you in that contest. We haven't decided what it's going to be a drawing for yet, but I'm sure it will be some history goes bump gear. Absolutely. So we'll be drawing for that on Christmas Day. So make sure you get those things taken care of in the next couple weeks. We want to thank you guys for listening to this episode. I have been your host, Diane. And this has been Denise. You take care now. Bye-bye. Executive producers of this episode have been Levi Drescher, Dan Foytek, Janice Carlson, Stephen Pappas, Heather Williams, David Ann Student, Amy Connor, Tanya Turner, Nicole Johnson, Leanna Sapien, Jade Lewis, April Rogers Crick, Laura Davis, Seth Crawford, Tracy Duhon, Josh Wood, Laura S., and Barbara Metz Goudreau. Thank you. Societies rise and societies fall. When the time comes, one society steps forward to build a better future. The Wicked Library, Kettle Whistle Radio, Night Story Podcast, Prog Watch, Red Horse Radio, The Lift, History Goes Bump, Listen, The M Writing Podcast. Society 13, Rebuilding Society, one podcast at a time. Fan of the show? Subscribe to the show on iTunes, Stitcher, or your favorite podcast catcher. We would greatly appreciate your review at iTunes as well to help the show grow. Thank you. 